So good morning. We have uh, 41 participants in the meetup this morning and would like to welcome all of you to this Higher Ed Technology Pros meetup. This is our first time trying to uh, do this virtually uh, and we're excited about the opportunity and we're certainly excited about the interest that has been shown from you folks and uh, welcome. We're, we're running from uh, from the United States to Canada in terms of people who are here. So we're very excited about that. Let me, my name is Elmore Alexander. Uh, I'm a principal consultant with Optimal Campus and a retired dean uh, from Bridgewater State University of the Business School there. And I'm gonna be the moderator today. Let me give you some guidelines as to how we're gonna try and run things today. We've got three panelists and we've asked each of them to talk for about five to seven minutes about one specific topic, which is what we heard from you in terms of your interest. And that is what's going on at their campus right now. And secondly, what do they think is going to be happening in the fall? So that's where we're going to be beginning. Uh, if you have questions during the presentations, we'd invite you to submit those through chat function. Uh, at the conclusion of the presentations, Michael Ginsburg from Optimal Campus is going to be tracking those questions and he will move those uh, to the panelists and we will try and capture your questions there. After that, we're going to try and open it up and let uh, a discussion happen with comments and questions coming from the group. So we'll see how, how that works. At the end of the program, Nuno Kudo of, of Optimal Partners will summarize the session and talk to you about our plans for the future and where we wanna go. Right now, you might consider turning off your video. Well, we aren't sure, but we think that might have some bandwidth issues. You can certainly turn your video back on to ask a question late, later on, but uh, you know that might help you from the standpoint of yours. Right now, everyone is muted. Uh, but you'll have the ability, you have the ability to turn off your mute so that you can ask a question later on. But right now we've got that going. When we do get to that general discussion, uh, if you can use the raise hand function at that point, that might be helpful in terms of us being able to recognize you. And again, I reiterate, this is our first time. We're not completely sure what we're doing and how to do that. And uh, we welcome your participation. We're happy to have you here. So let's move right now to the panelists. I'm going to begin with Ray Lefebvre, a uh, former colleague of mine at uh, Bridgewater State University, where he was the CIO and an impressive add uh, to uh, our IT operation there. I think we were prepared for a lot of things that we weren't sure of, sure about because of what Ray did. He's currently the Vice Chancellor of Technology and CIO at the UMass Boston. So Ray, I'll turn it to you. Tell us about what you see is going on at your campus right now and what do you think is going to happen in September? Well, thank you, Elmore, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to start by saying thank you all for joining today's How Are You Surviving? COVID-19 Crisis IT Leadership Panel Discussion. As IT leaders and individual contributors, we are all being impacted in negative and positive ways by being plunged into IT business and instructional continuity with little to no warning and very little time to prepare. Today's meetup is meant to be an opportunity for information sharing around how we are all coping with the COVID-19 crisis with an emphasis on what we have all been doing to transition our IT operations from on campus to remote without missing a beat. The UMass Boston COVID-19 journey began a little earlier than many others. On Thursday, January 30th, to be exact, when UMass Boston experienced the first ever reported case of COVID-19 in the state of Massachusetts, and at the time, the eighth reported case in the nation. The UMass Boston senior leadership team, which I am a member of, quickly activated our institutional crisis management team to deal with the in initial reported case, which turned out to be an isolated offsite incident that did not impact our campus. In response to the initially reported case on January 30th, IT stood up a COVID-19 call center in less than three hours, which allowed the institution to field calls from concerned students, parents, faculty, and staff. The call center remains in place and is brought online and offline as needed. 
A lot has changed since the initial reported case at UMass Boston on January 30th, in that the COVID-19 has become and continues to be a pandemic. And like all of you, our institution of higher education has transitioned to remote teaching, learning, and working, thus implementing full-blown instructional and business continuity overnight, with our remote operations having gone live on Monday, March 23rd. UMass Boston has been fully remote since March 23rd, five weeks and counting, and now more than ever, our students, faculty, and staff are dependent on IT services for teaching, learning, and working. Today's meetup is about sharing information on how we are all coping with COVID-19 crisis from an IT leadership perspective. You'll be hearing about the positive and negative impacts of COVID-19 on our operations. We'll hopefully come away with some useful information for your institution. So how has COVID-19 impacted UMass Boston IT operations? Well, COVID-19 has impacted IT operations at UMass Boston in so many ways, with the biggest impact being adaptation to remote leadership via Zoom, making sure that IT team members are kept healthy, safe, and engaged. Along those lines, here are a few examples of how we've dealt with our adjustment to remote teaching, learning, and working, as well as the challenge of remote leadership, because it is different. We started by establishing Operation Divide and Conquer, a COVID-19 response plan that we launched on Friday, March 20th, the day before we went into full-blown remote operations. Operation Divide and Conquer initially had six phases, pre-lockdown, impending lockdown, lockdown, stabilization, standard operations, and re-entry. Pre-lockdown, impending lockdown, and lockdown were all about getting ready to be off campus. We saw what was, what was coming our way, and we started to prepare accordingly with business continuity plans, as well as getting the team ready to go. We were in stabilization period until uh, starting uh, this past Monday when we entered into standard operations. What that means is we really have figured out how to run our operation remotely now, and we're starting to re return to some normal work, al although it's remote. And we're starting to, to do re-entry planning, operational scenario planning, both at the institutional level as well as the IT level. Operation Divide and Conquer had six areas of focus initially, communications, information security, ticket management, loaning dev loaner devices, remote access, and live person chat support. A quick highlight is it's very important to communicate during these times. Um, we've been communicating at least two messages per week out to the, all of the faculty, students, and staff and we have heightened communications across the IT division. We have a heightened focus on information security. Now is the highest time of risk for us as IT leaders to deal with the data protection and privacy. And because of that, we've made that one of our key areas of focus. The ser uh, customer service around ticket management has been our primary focus, making sure that if people need something fixed right away and need assistance, we can help them. In the loaner device area, we purchased 200 Chromebooks uh, through a fundraising effort and provided those to our students in need. Uh, we recently went online with Google Authentication, even though we're a full-blown Microsoft shop. Uh, Google Authentication allowed us to provide Chromebooks to our students uh, if for loaning, as well as Windows laptops to our, our faculty and staff for loaning purposes. We also stood up a brand new live person chat support uh, capability so that uh, within, um, it only took us about three to four weeks. Uh, it's quite amazing how innovative people are being nowadays. As part of our program, we've also established daily IT leadership team meetings, business continuity meetings, which are now going to twice weekly next week. I established a daily digest so that every day I send an email out to the whole division, keeping them informed of what is happening, both at the institutional level and within IT. We also established bi-weekly check-in meetings with the departments so that we, I could connect with each department. Yesterday I had two department level meetings so I could connect with all the people in IT. We also, and these are ideas hopefully that you might be able to use at your shop, we also uh, have Microsoft Teams. And so we launched a Microsoft Teams uh, continuity site, business continuity site, and we have a business continuity channel, a general discussion channel, and we also launched an IT Eats channel where people are sharing their recipes and being able to connect in social ways out, out because they can't be on campus. Um, we also established virtual team building. We have early risers on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays where people come to a Zoom meeting just to have coffee together. And we have a lunch and learn in the afternoon on um, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays as well so that people can get together for lunch. Um, 
Something I just want to touch on as well is that um, this is the time to innovate. This is the time to empower your staff to do advanced things. One of the things we're doing to innovate is we did not have a virtual desktop environment, but within uh, five weeks already, we've stood up something called Cloud PC. It's a Microsoft Windows virtual desktop environment, which will be launching next week and providing the capabilities of students, faculty, and staff to access a Windows desktop from any device, anywhere, anytime. It was also innovative that my team stood up the live person uh, within three weeks as well. Starting on Monday, we're launching Stronger Together Shout Out Program. The Stronger Together Shout Out Program is built on Microsoft Teams. It's a channel called Stronger Together in Microsoft Teams and staff are being um, uh, promoted to uh, give recognitions to each other online in our virtual environment. So as you can see, remote leadership benefits from having a plan and engaged leadership and staff. I'd like to believe that Operation Divide and Conquer has helped UMass team, uh, Boston IT team navigate and respond to this COVID-19 crisis while greatly minimizing the potential negative impact. Thank you for um, being here today, and I'd like to turn it back over to our host, uh, Elmore Alexander. Okay, thanks, Ray. Great insight and impressive strategy. Uh, let me turn now to George Claffey. George is the CIO at Central Connecticut State University and was formerly at Western Connecticut and Charter Oak. Uh, George has been a presenter with us on uh, several occasions in the past. George, can you tell us a bit about what has been going on at your school and moving forward? Thank you, Elmore. Good morning, everybody. Uh, happy to be here. Um, you know, we're, I'm at a public institution, Central Connecticut uh, State University. Uh, you know, that's the second largest public institution in Connecticut. And, you know, when you talk about things that are changing, um, we've got 130 Guard members on our campus right now. Um, you know, members of the state of Connecticut, members of Hartford Healthcare. You know, we're converting our rec center in gym into a field hospital uh, with 240 beds to be a triage center. Uh, we've already converted four of our dorm rooms for first responders. We're barracksing the military. Um, we've got doctors and nurses who are working on the front lines who are exposed to COVID-19 and don't want to go home to their family and potentially uh, expose their family. We have a whole dorm. It's going to be COVID. It is. It is COVID positive. And so these are, you know, healthcare workers uh, that are positive, but, you know, aren't, don't have such a severe case. Um, that they require hospitalization. Again, they don't want to bring that home. And so I've got to tell you, you know, we've, we've changed a lot in, in the past six weeks. And um, I've said, you know, for 20 years as the CIO uh, at various institutions, you know, no one's going to die if, if this network goes down. Um, I'm not sure I can say that anymore today. And I think that's a, I think that's a big change for those CIOs like myself who haven't had a healthcare facility attached to them. Uh, our HIPAA requirements and those things have been very limited to our health center and, and very narrow in how we're approaching them. And, and all of a sudden, you know, hospitals are dropping on networks and we're running armored fiber cables and other things. And it, it really is um, almost a military operation. And, and they've done it in 10 days, you know, we've, we've rewired um, almost five buildings on campus to support them in their own dedicated infrastructure. So, uh, you know, that's really interesting. It's certainly going into our fall planning because, you know, while we're hopeful that we're, we're building this facility in concert with our partners and we'll never use it, you know, there's, there's some acknowledgement that we may not have our rec center back on fall. You know, we may not have a basketball game or practice uh, you know, in fall in anything that needs the gym because, you know, that's got 224 beds uh, in it right now. So, you know, we're looking at multiple scenarios. Uh, you know, one is where we return to a modified, you know, fall converting, uh, you know, dorms that used to house two people or three people into one person dorms. And, and we're doing a lot of, I say we're doing a lot of math. I wish I was an economics major right now. Um, you know, we're spending a lot of time looking at how will these changes impact the institution going forward? And what does that look like? And, and if we go back, and I think we're, you know, we're looking at a couple different scenarios. You know, one is, you know, we may start and we may start at a lower capacity we may start and find out that there are a number of COVID positive people 
uh, on campus and that we need to begin social distancing again. And so we're, we're using this concept, you know, um, anywhere, anytime learning. So, you know, ideally that's in the classroom, it's in the traditional format, but we're beginning to talk to instructors and we're talking to our IT folks about what is the technology that is going to enable people to be most comfortable in the fall. And maybe that means that that I'm going to go to, to school one week and have the potential to go offline. But maybe if I'm autoimmune deficient or something like that, and I want this experience, but I'm just not comfortable with me going in there or my child's daycare closes, that I can attend that class virtually, synchronously, and have a similar experience and return when it's comfortable for me. Um, I agree with, with Ray 100%. I mean, I think the institution has become uh, dependent on IT. Um, I like to think it was always somewhat dependent on IT, but it, it's certainly grown in that dependence. You know, we're hardening our IT infrastructure. Uh, I think maybe a little bit different from, from where Ray is, you know, we really went back to the partners that we already had you know, the Microsofts, the Cisco's and, and the Blackboard's. And we said, you know, you're a strategic partner of ours. You know, let's prove it. Let's, what, what are the tools in the toolbox that we can do? And, and I've got to say, by and far, that response has been pretty amazing. We've tried to shy away from chasing down the new shiny things. And, and we get approached with them all the time. People who say, hey, we've got a new product, a new strategy. And I'm not saying that's exclusive because we have implemented some new technology. Um, but by and far, we've gone with the community that, that's already integrated and already ready to go. And the metaphor that I've used for that is, you know, I say to people, if, you know, think about your garden hose. So if I've got a little trickle of water, and somebody needs a little bit more water, I can go over to the spigot and I can turn it up and I can get more flow. And that's what we got when we called Microsoft or Blackboard or Cisco. And if I don't have a spigot out there and someone says, hey, I need more flow, well, I need a plumber, I need a pipe, I need, you know, we've got to get in there with a torch, I got to cut a hole in the house, and, and we're replumbing part of the house. And so we explain that metaphor to members of the executive staff and we say, you know, where possible, look for vendors that we've already integrated and they're already SAML authenticated. See if, see if they can come up. We're, as we turn the corner, I think uh, similar to Ray, you know, we're now looking at legal agreements. The people like Microsoft and Adobe, um, you know, they were great extending licenses for free through, you know, the beginning of June. Well, we're beginning to look at that and saying, okay, what does that look like if we get into... Uh, the fall semester is that do we need to change our campus agreement or do we need to change our entitlement to allow virtual portability or those things? Um, and so we're, we're beginning to look at that. The other thing that I think is, uh, uh, I'll kind of finish with, um, managing the supply chain. You know, we were, I think we were in front of this. Um, you know, we, similar to Ray, you know, we had an early probable case and that was one of our uh, students. Uh, who reported to us that she may have been exposed and we initiated our, our, lock, our, our uh, evacuation protocol. And at that point, we began consuming large quantities of uh, IT. I think I even burnt through a whole state credit card. Um, you know, so we bought webcams and Chromebooks and laptops and other things. It's getting harder to find those right now. And so I think, you know, as we look at fall, if you're, if you're planning on that expense now, you should be buying it now because, you know, you've got a uh, that's going to give you a chance of getting it in fall. Between the overseas factories that are shutting down, the challenge of getting imports in, the reliance on, you know, overseas manufacturing for components, um, you know, I think supply chain management and logistics are going to be critical to us uh, opening up in fall. Thank you. Said thank you, George. Uh, we're running a little slow on our logistics there, uh, but that is fascinating. Absolutely fascinating discussion, and uh, uh, the uh, focus on wish you knew more math is certainly uh, certainly something out there for all of us. I I was talking to Barney Frank a couple of years ago when he was speaking to our students, and student asked him what the most important course to take was, and the Barney Frank that I never would have expected this to come from said. Oh, take more mathematics and economics. Uh, we'll switch now to Jim. Uh, James Stoffel. James is the Director of Technology and Data Security Offer at Shoah Boston. 
totally different kind of facility, very small, very focused internationally. And I think Jim's going to, James is going to be able to give us some very, very different insight as to what happens in a, in a small IT operation. James. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Elmore. And thanks everybody for attending. Uh, it's a pleasure to come up here and, and talk. Uh, as Elmore indicated, the institution that I work for is much different. Uh, I'd love to have that um, state credit card with an unending balance. That would be lovely. Um, fortunately, I don't. Uh, Showa Boston, again, is an international student. Our students majority uh, come from Tokyo. Now, uh, we do get some other students from other uh, countries as well as some fellows. The uniqueness of that means that uh, obviously our presence uh, is kind of unique in that if the world's closing their borders to have students or people coming here, that means we're not going to get anybody on campus. Whereas, you know, you still have United States, you know, X states that people still travel. There is hope that those colleges were open. Ours is a little different. Our typical semester is about two, 250 uh, students. So we have about four semesters. Again, our school's not kind of similar in the same layout of classes as a typical college. Sometimes we have overlapping classes. So we have about a thousand students that come and go through the course of the year. What that means though is that, you know, technology, I am squeezing every dime I can possibly get and utilizing when I can. So when we started hearing about the issues about the virus in January, immediately uh, we looked to a safety committee that consisted of faculty, uh, the health department, student services, academics, technology, uh, HR, as well as obviously the provost. Uh, we looked at trying to determine, okay, you know, what are, what are we looking at from a bigger picture? Is this really going to impact us? And then we started doing a what ifs. And taking notes, we started looking at what would be the biggest issue that would be the biggest impact. And for us, it would be going to online classes. We immediately started hearing bigger colleges doing that. And we started looking into what it would take. Again, it's a small college. So the infrastructure does have your wireless. It has your, you know, podiums with laptops and students being their, their own laptops. But to turn around and say, okay, can we offer, you know, uh, you know Zoom online classes to all 250 students because they stay on campus. They can't go home. They're international. So they're coming to our campus and staying on campus the whole time. So the question is, could we do that? So we had some work that we had to do from a technology standpoint. We had to make sure that we could do um, measure the bandwidth and determine what we could do. So we started, uh, that was pretty much uh, the beginning, end of Feb uh, January, beginning of February. So we started looking that remote access would definitely be necessary. And we started rolling out uh, VPNs to those that were immediately starting to show stress because we found that in a myriad of different departments, some staff and faculty were a little bit more nervous than others. HR took a nice approach and said, you know, you can't question that. You can't understand someone else's fear. So let's just go with it. And we started making sure that <clears throat> from a technology standpoint, people could get to the exact um, files and folders that they needed on campus as well as on campus. And that took a huge uh, burden off most people's shoulders, knowing that they wouldn't get behind work and stuff like that. But <clears throat> during this whole process, HR and the provost were uh, emailing pretty much a couple of times a week to just show what the updates are, indicating what was coming out of the safety committee. And in February, we started to make sure that our risk assessments, our plans and how we were going to do this were uh, being um, pretty much held to. In other words, making sure that each department understood what their role was and to ensure that everyone understood it outside that. The nursing department was making sure that there were communications with the State Board of Health and transferring all that information to us in layman's terms so we could understand that. And then in turn, making sure that the rest of the staff would understand that. So in starting in February, and as additional to our risk assessment, we were understanding that we would need to have a, these, what we would call level ones, where there's rumored of the virus outside the campus, but not on the campus, all the way to level four, where we have students and or staff on campus who have had it and have made other people contagious and how would we deal with it. Starting in February, we started to have those meetings every two weeks with emails going out in between that to keep everybody abreast. Meantime, we had to look at our infrastructure. We found from an infrastructure standpoint, 
again, being a small school, our wireless was not really focused for online. We've never done online learning. And that brought up um, not only from an infrastructure standpoint, but it also brought up the question of faculty because they've never done that. And our faculty is kind of a mix of older faculty and younger faculty. And when I say younger, I'm, I'm talking, we'll say like 30s. But we have faculty that that are in their 60s up to in their 70s still um, getting, you know, that they're actually getting ready to retire. But the question is, could they do that? And there wasn't necessarily a matter of pushback. It was more of, of an uneasiness. They didn't know how that was going to be implemented. So it really, we had to make sure that academics technologist, he was able to convey through, you know, working with me that our LMS, which we happen to use Moodle, is sufficient enough to, to provide their classroom material in a way that the students would still be able to have access and they as teachers could still do it through use of other types of applications, namely Zoom. So we had to look at purchasing, obviously licensing for Zoom, and we had to look at what we had to do with the wireless. So the wireless we've actually had to upgrade now uh, because it wasn't sufficient enough if we had all the students on campus and all of them needed to have 100% wireless to make sure that they had 100% um, like how I would say not degraded video feed. So that was the biggest question. And that's that probably was our biggest issue in doing that. And then of course it all comes down to cost and then that that was interesting because from a small college standpoint, you know, we had to look at other capital projects and reprioritize that. And facilities had to give up some projects in order to give money to us because we had to pull in wiring, we had to order more devices, put more devices in the classrooms, uh, as well as get equipment that could be loaned out you know, for the faculty that didn't have the proper infrastructure to work from home. And that too also involved us also making sure that we were creating uh, training videos on how to set up VPN, how to determine if your home network is capable of doing that. So we had to make sure we had Word documents that had great um, screenshots, but also proper uh, verbiage. So we weren't like using gigabits and megabits. We had to, you know, use words like bandwidth and stuff. So it was, it was really kind of, I would say, unique in a sense that it was quick and fast, but all the different departments were able to pull things together and get everything going. The question now is, you know, can we do it? Um, and we can. Now, the, from us standpoint, again, being uh, dealing with internationalists, now it's a question is, are the borders going to be opened up to a level that the other countries, i.e. Tokyo, are they going to feel comfortable and sending their students over? So now we're looking at a potential where they still may not be comfortable, comfortable enough to do that, so yes, we'll still do online classes, but instead of the students being on campus, they may, I think we'll say like two weeks delay and test it out. So we'll be doing Zoom classes, but they'll still be in Tokyo at home. So now we're looking at doing training, like what's the difference between doing it on site or when they're at home? And they're realizing as faculty, like, oh, it's really, really no difference. The student is just in a different location, but they can still access it. And then it's just a matter, okay, if they're still in Tokyo, can they go in and still access Moodle remotely? And is our bandwidth going to be able to cover that? So, and uh, we're, we're pleased in that regards. But that's what we've been dealing with. Uh, it's still a matter of making sure that we have um, emails going out twice a week, making sure that the faculty are aware of what's going on from the provost level, and making sure that... Uh, we're funneling questions and then we're creating any, um, we did create an FAQ because we've had repeated questions from faculty about working from home, um, doing online classes. So with collaboration of the academics department, HR and myself, you know, with our department, we were able to create an FAQ and then HR has sent that out and then said, you know, these are questions that we're receiving. A lot of it were duplicates, um, but it allowed us to create this nice little form and then they sent it out. and. I think the comfort level has um, grown probably a double, you know, in this past month than it was in March. I think a lot of people were more nervous about the unknowns, but I think communication was the biggest issue. I wouldn't say transparency, but being trying to be as transparent as possible to ensure that everyone was part of the process and knew where they stood, I think made a huge difference. So, uh, yes. but 
that's it from my end. Well, that's great, James. Thank you very much. And it is an interestingly different situation looking at the small school. So uh, Michael Ginsburg has been monitoring chat, and I think he sort of, uh, at this point, uh, pulled together uh, some key questions that he's seeing from a number of you. So I'm going to let Michael jump in here and pose a few questions to our panelists. Michael? Thanks, Elmore. Um, so there are a couple questions, uh, and I'm going to try to take these in the order they, they uh, came in. Uh, so really going back to um, who was talking first? Ray. Ray, okay, Ray. So this was uh, questions about the use of Chromebooks, and, and uh, did, was it necessary with using all those Chromebooks, with the faculty using all those Chromebooks, to VPN to campus, uh, to the campus network? And if so, what VPN did you use? Okay, first, first of all, Chromebooks are a game changer for uh, higher education. You, as everyone knows, uh, they got their start in K through 12. And uh, at Bridgewater State University, we adopted Chromebook technology and Google authentication about three or four years ago. At UMass Boston, we brought Chromebooks online. I've only been at UMass Boston for 11 months. And uh, we just recently brought Google authentication online. Luckily, right before the crisis hit, um, and the Chromebooks were a natural fit. Now, Chromebooks, um, again, they're low cost for both us as institutional leaders. They're low cost for our student body. Uh, Microsoft uh, Office has come a long way. You can use all, all the uh, capabilities from the cloud. And when you marry um, Chromebooks up with virtual desktop technology, the sky's the limit. Think about that. You know, we've gone with Microsoft Windows virtual desktop. I used VMware at, at Bridgewater State University, but no matter what combination. Now, when it comes to VPN, you know, we use Palo Alto. Palo Alto is our, our VPN provider. And uh, as part of that uh, Operation Divide and Conquer, we, we went behind the scenes and we checked our, our capabilities and how our, our, our um, firewall was operating and the capacity and capabilities of it. Um, we, we haven't had any problems, Knockwood, uh, with our bandwidth with VPN. We have uh, probably about 400 uh, faculty and staff uh, dialing in every day using remote desktop capabilities. Personally my, and professionally, my hope is once we launch Cloud PC, our, our virtual desktop technology platform, is that over time, like at Bridgewater State University, we can actually wind down the VPN. At Bridgewater State University, we uh, all but turned off the VPN to only uh, IT personnel, and that's because everyone started to use their virtual desktops and realized they didn't need VPN anymore. They didn't need to have remote desktop access anymore. They could access all their resources right from within the cloud. So luckily, no problems with bandwidth. Chromebooks are excellent. I promote them highly. And the side benefit is um, we loaned out these Chromebooks to our students. And when we, when we get them back, uh, and we're going to be purchasing some additional ones, um, we're going to be able to start a Chromebook loaner program for our students, hopefully in the fall. Um, to date, we've only been loaning out MacBooks uh, on limited quantity and uh, Windows laptops limited quantity. But I'm really excited at the potential of how uh, Chromebooks are really going to change the, uh, the, the equation a lot for our mainly for our students. Ray, how many, how many Chromebooks do you have in your closet to distribute in September? Um, ironically, we, we still have about 100 left in inventory. Uh, we still have a loaner laptop program in place, and there, there's about five going out per week, and we just are putting in another order for another 200. Uh, we're, we actually, we were already committing to go down this road even before the crisis hit. We also have uh, 14 teaching labs with about 24 desktop computers in each. And we're going to be, uh, in the fall, we're going to convert those to be all Chrome boxes. And we're going to marry those Chrome boxes up with the cloud PC software uh, platform. And so uh, think about it. If I was going to up upgrade 14 teaching labs with all Windows desktops, they're about eight years old right now. Uh, you know, that would be around, you know, obviously, uh, probably $300,000. Uh, instead, we'll probably be spending around uh, $80,000 to upgrade those same 14 teaching labs using uh, Chrome technologies. Now's the time more than ever to start taking advantage of blending Microsoft environments and Google environments together. They can both coexist. Michael, what, so, what's next question? So really, uh, Ray, I think you probably answered this, but uh, the other question about Chromebooks was, were faculty able to, or faculty and students, able to access all of the software that, uh, that they needed, or what, what percentage of the software? Were, were there things that they couldn't do through the Chromebooks? Yeah, the answer is no. They couldn't access everything they needed. And, and in particular, we use Respondus as our proctored exam software platform. And Respondus um, yeah, doesn't work with Chromebooks. And, uh, and then Respondus also needs to be installed on, locally on a Windows laptop, for example. 
So that was an example where a student did uh, borrow a Chromebook, but then couldn't do Respondus, so we, we exchanged that for a Windows laptop. So what we, what we found is about, um, you know, about 10% uh, of our students haven't been able to use a Chromebook because they have specialized software needs. For example, ArcGIS for our engineering students, uh, that wouldn't run on a Chromebook. And I, I really wish Cloud PC had launched, uh, you know, sooner. Uh, it's going to launch next week because that's where we're going to be able to put ArcGIS, for example, on one of our engineering images for Cloud PC. That's what we're looking to the future of. So the Chromebook is a platform. It's really just an endpoint device and, and it can do a lot on its own. Um, it's, they can do their school, standard schoolwork on it, the students. Uh, but yeah, there's specialized needs. You can't meet every need. But I think if you marry that up with uh, virtual desktop technologies, it really starts to fill the gap. Michael? Thanks, yeah, uh, George, I, this, this came up while you were talking. And it's a question about licenses and then you're planning for the, the fall. And since speaking of licenses and, and planning for fall and extending agreements or agreements, or planning for more remote work, how's that affecting budgets? Have you had to move budgets from other areas or increase them? Yeah, so thank you. Um, you know, and I wanna uh, preface my earlier one, you know, we we had a DR budget for disaster recovery with about $700,000 that was in it that, that previous CIOs to me had, had put a little bit in each year, probably over 15 years. So part of how we funded the large purchase was we broke the glass. Um, you know, we went to the president early and said, this is going to be a disaster. We've got to get out in front of it. Um, and so we've spent a lot of that money that we had in our disaster recovery uh, to sort of harden uh, that environment. So from a license standpoint, and we're doing this with all vendors, um, you know, we're going to them and we're saying, hey, look, you know, we're the state, you know, is an institution. We're having fiscal problems. Um, what can you do for us? And, and we've been pleasantly surprised with the number of vendors who have come back with uh, natural discounts or other things. Uh, one of the other challenges that we had was that there were two or three conversion projects that we were working on. So we were moving our web CMS from one product into another product. And so we went back to those vendors and said, hey, you know, can you help us here? You know, we think it's going to, you know, we're not going to be out of that license quite as long as we would. Can you extend that? So, I mean, I think having an open and direct conversation with, with all of your vendors uh, is helpful. I like to think that, you know, sometimes we're in front of, um, you know, the, the, where the vendors are. Um, you know, if you're an Adobe or somebody like that, that's a big question to talk about extending a free license. And so we're talking to them today about, you know, what is, what is our ability, I think, sort of what Ray said, you know, how do we create virtual labs? And so if I can't buy an Adobe license for, you know, 12,000 FTEs, you know, what are my options for providing a virtual lab environment for 100 people so that they can remote in? And, you know, we're, it is, it's this hybrid of, you know, is it VDI? Is it remote desktop? Is it, you know, remote connect to a PC that's physically on campus? You know, there's a, a three or four ways to, to provide access to the higher end tools. I completely agree with Ray. You know, if you're just using Microsoft Office, a web browser, Blackboard, WebEx, Zoom, like the Chromebook is gonna be 100%. We found for a large number of our faculty, they came back and said, hey, we're using some advanced functions, we're using some other things. And so our option was either to connect them back to the desktop on their desk remotely, um, or, to get them connected to almost a, a rack of computers that are serving as a grid. And in each one of those computers is something that you can discreetly connect to and then run your, you know, your STEM software uh, and things like that. And so, you know, each, each license agreement is different and they're long. And so, you know, the first thing we do is we read it because um, we haven't read it in a while. Then we reach out to the vendor and talk to them about fall and spring. Um, and then we figure out, you know, sometimes we're upgrading our budget and, and sometimes we're finding that we can do something within the agreement that we already own. And Michael? Hey, yes. Michael, this, this is Ray. You. Is it okay if I weigh in? Sure. Okay. Yeah, building on uh, what George is saying, um, you know, UMass Boston, you know, from a budget perspective, I want to, you know, let people know, like, we very quickly froze our spending. You know, we, we put a freeze in place uh, uh, you know, across our institution for, unless it was for institutional or business continuity purposes. So we immediately, uh, you know, reigned control of our budget. Um, you know, we established an emergency fund. Uh, like George was saying, they had a, an emergency fund set up. 
you know, uh, very, very working very closely with the Vice Chancellor of Administration and Finance, an emergency fund was established so that every purchase we are doing, we're tagging, uh, and we're trying to map it back to the stimulus funding. So obviously many of us are going to be uh, going through the efforts of, of getting that stimulus funding. And as a state university, we're dependent on state appropriations as well. So we're clearly trying to figure out what's gonna happen to our state appropriations for FY21. Uh, but for FY20, by freezing the spending, it's helped us. And the other thing we've noticed is that there were things we were going to do on campus that we're not there to do right now. So IT alone, for example, we have um, multiple projects where we might have expended maybe another 100000 or $200,000 between now and the end of the fiscal year. Uh, we, we can't do that. So it's going to come out on balance, I think, okay for us, uh, hopefully for all of us. Uh, I think the stimulus funding is probably going to play an important part in that. And one last thing is that George has touched on all the vendors, you know, Zoom, Blackboard, Microsoft, um, they've all been, like you said, very, very flexible with us. They've really been uh, helping us to uh, build out our capacity. Uh, and, but like George said, we're going to have to now look at uh, what's going to happen to those contracts and license extensions hereafter. Yeah, if I could just add just one more thing. We've some, seen the same thing with the vendors. In fact, we've had some vendors like our, our copier lease agreements. Um, they've um, taken like three months of payments and just absorbed them. Uh, which was amazing. We've had other vendors come back and give us 20% uh, discounts for renewals or they've spread out payment structures out further so we didn't have to pay for now. Something that we renew, they've extended, in fact, um, you know, work with Nucel and stuff. It's like we've just extended uh, contracts out, uh, existing ones, and then they'll, we'll worry about the renewals then. I mean, a lot of the vendors have been amazing in trying to ensure that the educational realm just stays floating and working. Thanks, James. So I'd like to switch to a, a sort of a broader question. Uh, Julia has asked something that I've been writing about lately and, and lo we'd love to hear about it. Uh, and she said that uh, she'd like to hear what people are thinking about their physical classroom spaces. Uh, are you doing regular upgrades? Are you postponing? Are you changing them? Uh, and, and I would extend that to where do you think that's going to be in the future? How, how, are, how are classroom needs going to change? And that's for, for anyone, any George, of you. George, you've got the biggest conversions going on. Why don't you start yeah. talking so, about um, that? And, and, you know, the, one, of the, one of the challenges and, and one, of the, uh, one of the helpful things, you know, we had a number of staff that, that their job is to be in the field. Um, and so, you know, I, I, you know, we said to them early in this, you know, with that job isn't here, we're going to continue to pay you, but let's talk about what, you know, you can do that helps, you know, keep moving the ball forward down the football field. And so the two things that they did, um, one will connect directly. And, and the other thing I'll just mention, because I think it's, it's helpful as a go forward strategy. So they began a massive inventory, which they, they already had a, this, this giant grid of classrooms, but they began looking at each classroom and what was the tech that was already on there. Most of our rooms were digitally connected, but they started looking at, okay, what does it look like if we want to put a camera in the front of this? We want to look at a lecture capture system or a live streaming system. What's the health of that room? What's the capacity of that room? What's the dimensions of that room? And they actually put a grade to those rooms. And then they put a estimate which was super helpful to me of dollars. So, you know, this room is going to be less than $10,000 to get that room ready to do hybrid learning come fall. Well, that's a no brainer for us if we need those rooms, you know, then there's a $20,000 cut, there's a $30,000 cut. And then there's a, you know, after 50, it's not even on our list. That's too big of a lift for us to do with, even if I can get a vendor on campus. And I want to be clear, you know, the national guard has, has created a barrier around parts of our campus, you know, I can, I can get in if I wear a class three jacket uh, and I'm on a list or I'm in fatigues, I guess. Um, so, you know, it's, we can't get the vendors in to do some of that work right now. So for us, grading our classrooms is the best thing we can be doing waiting for that product. We've already ordered at least 20 classrooms worth of technology to do upgrades. We looked at that less than $10,000 list and said, if that's the low hanging fruit, let's pick that right now. Um, the other thing I just wanna mention, you know, we, we had five or six people out of our staff of about 45 that were really on the campus folks. They of their own free will, you know, sort of said, what is it that we can do? Most of them have been retrained to work on our support desk. 
which is great because you know the number of tickets that came in the help desk have quadrupled um, and it was really a great sort of team effort so we had these people that were you know had a job where they were in a golf cart driving around fixing things on the fly and right now you know they've been of their own design they retrained um, you know and and they're now working our help desk and really in a in an area that's valuable to, um, add, yeah. Yeah, yeah, to add to the conversation, um, you know, at, U at UMass Boston, and you know, we run a formal project management office, and we run an annual classroom, lab, and meeting space upgrades project. And uh, that project was uh, for fiscal year FY20, uh, it was in flight. Uh, everything's on hold right now. Uh, like I said, the vendors are waiting to come back in. Um, so we'll be resuming that as soon as uh, we can, it's safe to be back on campus. So we'll continue to do our upgrades. Um, you know, like George was touching on though, there's a lot of opportunity here where staff have been redeployed to do remote operations. The instructional support team and, uh, and the um, uh, media services team work closely together anyway, normally. And so the staff have been redeployed to support the live person chat platform. And so now we have 15 staff members manning our live chat uh, from, uh, from like nine to uh, 6 p.m. at night. Um, they've, they're specialists in Zoom. They're also specialists in Echo 360 and VoiceThread. Uh, we use Echo 360 and VoiceThread for recording um, uh, lectures and, and presentations that students can watch and listen to on their, on their own. Um, and again, the staff has been able to do that. So we need to continue to invest in our future, but also we need to realize that the future is going to be different when we return to campus. And um, we don't want to overspend right now. We're, we're just going to uh, take a wait and see approach to when we do get back on campus. Michael, let me jump in here for just a second. Uh, sure. We've been talking in the background and we think this, this uh, questioning coming through you is working well and uh, we're scared of trying to, to uh, organize everyone else asking questions. So if folks will keep firing questions to you through chat, we're going to try and stay in that mode. And we apologize, but as I said, we haven't done this before and we're trying to learn on the fly. So what's the next question you've got, Michael? Okay, so, so actually it's a very interesting one uh, that, that Joe from, I think from Wheaton, but I think he has dropped off uh, because he had another call, has asked, but uh, something very, very uh, things we, all, we all must be dealing with. Uh, we generally provided a, a, an environment for online learning very quickly. Uh, in many cases, it's Zoom and email. But as he says, we all know there is much more that must be done uh, for a, a, a real uh, rich online learning environment. Uh, but that's going to cost a lot and it's going to take some time. And wondering what people are doing uh, now and uh, uh, do they have plans to have a different environment for online learning in the fall than, than currently? And uh, how about beyond the fall? Yeah, James, you probably got the biggest change there. Maybe you should start because uh, you're trying to pivot unbelievably, it seems to me. The issue we have uh, is the dynamics of trying to have an ESL classroom when the students are not part of that whole ESL experience is obviously their presence. The teacher is able to engage a student that seems a little hesitant, nervous, and talking and speaking English for the first time in front of their peers. The teacher is able to coax them out. The dynamics now change because you're trying to instill this same um, uh, paradigm, like but through Zoom, and we don't know how that's going to be. And just chatting with faculty, even the academic director, there is going to be some something lost in that to try to get you know, these students that are trying to learn English, trying to understand the culture and trying to have that properly conveyed. They're gonna be in video and that in itself changes it because they're not one-on-one. -on -one. The experience of being here is different. So they're trying to, with our LMS, implement little plugins like Poodle and Google Translate and stuff like that to try to uh, get more of them to do uh, online recording of stories, their own practice of speaking and stuff like that, and somehow try to get them more engaged. It's going to be the most difficult part in that, and whether or not it'll be successful is going to be very, we just, again, this is territory we've never been in, so we're literally going to be measuring it the very next day, and 
and then taking a second day and then starting to create metrics and determining what's working or not. This is probably going to be a moving target, you know, and yeah. as the technology is changing, it's just a matter of what other tools are out there that we can get these students further engaged from an ESL perspective. George, what's going on in Central Connecticut? Sure, and, and I think, you know, uh, uh, you'll hear more of the, you know, my former Charter Oak experience where Charter Oak was a completely online college um, and we're trying to bring some of those lessons forward. I, I mean, I really think it's pedagogical change. Um, you know, we, we sort of got a pass for uh, the last five weeks of the semester. It was a crisis. It was catch as catch can. You know, we've surveyed the students, we've surveyed the faculty, and they said, hey, you guys tried to keep it normal. You tried to get it done. And, and you know, the students were happy and the faculty were, were happy and, and we all did something. I think the expectations are a lot higher for fall. We've got the whole summer to ready ourselves. And in many of our environments, you know, the traditionally the faculty left in the summer. You know, if they weren't 12 month employees, you know, they, they went back to, you know, their, wherever they live and, and they come back later in August. They're working, but they're not on campus. And so our question is how to do it. And I think the best way to do that is to look at it pedagogically. You know, we had faculty that said to us, well, you know, we need online proctoring and we need other things. And, you know, my, my response, and I'm not the academic in the room, was just assume all these tests are going to be open book and, and online, right? Our tests can't be rote memorization anymore in a fully online environment because we'll find a way to get the book in front of you or a Google thing. You know, we've got to look at how we're looking at concepts and theories and the application of that. And so, you know, if I had a class and I taught it one way and it was, it was bubble sheets and tests and whatever, it may become essays and other things. It may have threaded discussions it, instead of group projects. It, it may not have final presentations that are in, in the way that they used to be with someone standing up front in PowerPoint. And so I think the best thing that we can do um, is begin working with our faculty. We've got something, the ITDRC, that's our faculty engagement. And we're saying, great, we got, we got through spring. How do we really use these tools that were a Blackboard shop? How do we use Blackboard to its fullest? How do we point people to online tutoring um, so that they can have their papers checked synchronously with a, uh, someone in the tutoring center? And so I think that that's our, our biggest challenge as we find this new normal. Okay, uh, I'm gonna grab things back here. We're uh, five minutes away from stop and we wanna honor your time on that. Uh, I'd like to bring Nuno in at this point to sort of, he's been monitoring the chat as well and sort of give him a chance to uh, talk about what he's seen in the conversation and what we're thinking about going forward. So uh, Nuno, and for those that don't, you don't know, Nuno's coming from two hours north of Toronto, uh, Canada this morning. So uh, we're spreading ourselves across the uh, North American continent here. Nuno? This is what happens when you marry someone from Canada and you work <laughs> in the Boston area. <laughs> Um, I, I just wanted to say thanks to, to everyone for uh, spending a little bit of time with uh, this considerable group. I think we are at approximately 50 to 60 people. 57 uh, was the top. 57. Wonderful, wonderful. You know, we just, um, I'm also from Optimal and uh, we're just trying to give back a little and um, help folks out. Um, we just want to make this as useful as, as possible for the community. This is more than a job for us. This is a mission help out uh, students and, and uh, folks such as yourselves. So if there's anything that you want to talk about, if there's anything that, um, any particular topic you want to discuss, if you want an introduction to someone else in, in, in the group, just, you know, just let us know. Um, tough times, unprecedented times, uh, we're all in this together. Um, there was, there was some talk in, in, in chat, I noticed, um, about doing this on um, a, a regular basis, a semi-regular basis, maybe addressing specific issues that are coming up um, uh, with the group, getting perspectives from others. So uh, we're, we're happy to, to do that. Um, uh, if anyone wants to get involved and, 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 and help us to do that, be panelists. Uh, uh, if you want to submit questions, uh, you know, feel free to do that for future uh, conversations. Um, uh, someone mentioned that having this conversation every two, every two weeks would be useful. Um, it, 
is noon okay for folks? And feel free to post your, your answers on chat. And the reason is because when we sent this out to, we, we got just last night, I got a number of replies saying, hey, how about us on the West Coast? Uh, we'd like to join too, but it's a little early. So is noon okay? Um, uh, Friday seemed to be okay, so feel free. Okay, I see. I see St. Anselm uh, saying noon is okay, noon is good, noon is good, okay. All right. Um, we're also going to leave this chat up uh, up for a while in case anyone has any other questions. Um, if anyone, uh, if, if you want us to share your contact information with others in the group, just let us know. Um, Tom, would you mind just putting, put, putting maybe um, your email up uh, up there or, you know, everyone's everyone's email here. If you want to contact any of us um, for introductions, questions, etc., feel free to do that. Yeah, Nuno. Th th Nuno, this is Ray. Hey, Ray. Yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming. I just put on the chat, I just put my email address out there. Uh, anybody who has common interests and wants to talk about uh, anything we talked about today offline, feel free to reach out to me. And uh, I'd love to hear how other people are dealing with this crisis as well. Now, Nuno, we're also going to be sending a questionnaire out to folks uh, pretty quickly here to get some feedback and some direction as to where we're going, right? Yes, yes, we will, we will do that. Thank you for the reminder. And, and, and folks, while you're on, you know, what worked during this conversation, what didn't work, you know, let us, let us know. We're happy to, to make adjustments. Um, so... Does anyone have any questions? Feel free to post them right on, on chat. Sorry we weren't able to do the actual, you know, video conversation, opening it up to everybody, or uh, we really want to do that, but there were so much interactions on chat. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say again, thanks for the panelists and thanks for anyone, for everyone joining, um, you know. Yeah, I think, uh, let me reiterate, George, Ray, and, and James, wonderful, wonderful insight. Michael, thanks for uh, tracking the chat and pulling questions forward. Uh, uh, I, I, think, I think I can speak for the organizing group. We're thrilled. Uh, this wasn't perfect. Uh, we stubbed our toes a few times that my connection was going in and out at one point in time. Uh, but personally, I think we're just thrilled at how the, this went and it's certainly very informative to me. So we'll look forward to seeing you again in the not too far distant future. We'll be reaching out to you and uh, stay safe out there, folks. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care, everybody. Bye. Um.